Hello and welcome back to Talking Wealth Podcast. Now today we're going to talk about when to sell stocks. Now, obviously that's a question that everybody has on their mind, but before we get too far into the topic and talk about the strategies about how you can look at selling stocks or when to sell stocks, I want to introduce my great co-host, Janine Cox. How are you today? Great. Thanks, Dale. How are you today? I'm excited about this topic. I know. Look, it's a topic that's a little bit taboo, isn't it, with some people? Well, I know, I mean, sell is a four-letter word. It starts with S. And there's a lot of words that start with S that people don't like, yeah. and sell is one of them. Yeah, exactly. It is. And so, but it's one of those things in the stock market. And mm. I mean, I know we talk about exit strategies all the time on our YouTube channel and, and our, you know, our, our live stream that we do on TalkingWealth.com. We're talking about exit because you know, all ships rise on the same boat. And if the stock market's bullish, anybody can sort mm. of make money. But you only make money when the money ends up in your bank account, yep. not when it's sitting in the market. So that's why I'm really, really excited today about, you know, helping people understand is when to sell stocks because that's probably one of the biggest questions we ever get asked, isn't mm. it? I mean, I guess you can look at it from a lot of points of view because people think it's more complex, the selling side, than buying. But is it's it really? It's simple. I think it's just a mind mess. You know, mm. I think that's where people is. It's their, it messes with their mind, mm. which causes them to make it hard, where it's not actually hard. It's actually quite easy. And, and often when we're teaching traders, one of the often things I say to them is the quicker you learn how to sell, the more money you're going to make. And, and then you get that strange look as how does that actually work? You know, selling stocks makes me more money. And the answer is, yeah, it does. Mm. It really does. That's the research and everything. Well, that's why it makes me think that people mm. are more, because of the emotion, the emotion must be stronger in those that find it hard to sell. That that mm. side of their emotions or whatever it's triggering in their emotions mm. um, is, is stronger than it is if from buying. Because when you go into a building, you're going to exit the building at some point. If you go in your car, you have to get out of your car. Mm. If you buy some stocks in the stock market at some point, you have to get out of those shares. Otherwise, what happens? I mean, you. Do, but people don't think of it as simply as that, but they can. That's the point of it. Yeah, I mean, I mean people spend a lot of time looking at stocks they want to buy and they're good at buying, mm. but they're not necessarily good at selling. So why do people sell stocks? Yeah, really good question. Why do people sell? Um, I think that a lot of people sell because of fear. Uh, it's look When people are trading short term, it's because they've got some sort of strategy in their mind as to how they want to buy and sell. It might not be right. I'm not suggesting that a lot of people that sell short term are doing mm. it the right way, but just generally it depends on, um, you know, the individual and what's happening with them at the time. It could be something in the media has made them fearful and they're selling because of that fear, or they might be selling because of greed because they want to just take that money off the market and run. But, well, but that's, that's fear as well, isn't that it? It is really? fear as well because fear of losing yeah, their profit. That's right. And I see that. And I, and I know what you mean. I mean, it's not, you know, on my market report that I do every single week for, for TalkingWealth.com. Uh, um, so if you want to watch that, it's um, me looking at the market every single week. So just go to TalkingWealth.com. But I know I might say, oh, I think the stock market is going to go down two weeks and people are going, oh, Dale says to sell. Yeah. And it's like, no, Dale didn't say to sell. Dale just said the stock market's going down for two weeks. But I could end, at the end of that sentence, I might say, I think it's going to go down for two weeks, maybe 5%. But by the end of the week, end of the month or end of the year, it'll be up 20% and they'll still hear Dale sell. said to sell. That's right. And it's like, where did you get mm. that from? The market's going down from two weeks because people quite often will hear what they want to hear based on their, their that fear and greed or those beliefs behind all that driving them. And it's, it's really to their detriment, isn't it? It is. And some people say that, they may need to sell the money by a certain time. So they've got some maybe mm. expense in, in mind that, that they need to use that those funds for. Yeah. Maybe the purchase of a house, a car or s something else that they need those funds for. So there's a group of people that are selling because of a need um, rather than necessarily greed and fear. But then they're sitting on the fence at times too, looking at, well, when do I sell? Do I just hold that little bit longer mm. um, past a certain point in time does Dale think the market's going to continue to go up and therefore maybe I'll hold it for another couple of months? Well, that's again greed because mm. I, I don't know how many times you've had this conversation, but I know I've had it numerous times. People say to me, hey, Dale, I want to give you X amount of dollars so you can manage it for me, mm. um, but I do need it back in three months or six months. 
And I go, why? And they go, oh, I'm buying a house or I'm doing this or I want to do that. And I go, so don't give it to me. Mm. And they're like, what do you mean? And I go, well, I'm not going to take that on. Yeah. Because if you need it to buy it to settle in a house, then there's absolutely no way known you're going to be putting it in the market for three or six months. Mm. And they go, but I can make more money on it. And I go, yeah, but you could also not That's be able to settle risk. on your house. <laughs> and they're like, oh, they don't think of that sort of stuff. And it was like, mm. oh, well, I've got all this money that I can earn Yes. You know, maybe 5 or 10 or 20% on the, you know, because these guys are going to magically make me a shed load of money and I'll be able to have, I'll be, then I'll be able to settle on my house and have more money. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because they, they treat it almost like cash, like a currency. Like they, they think do. they can just move it in and out. I guess the temptation with shares is that you can sell it anytime mm. you like and it's much, far more liquid than, say, if you own property and you mm. needed money, it's how, you get, how fast are you going to be able to move a house? You're not. Oh, you can't sell a bedroom. <laughs> yeah. You can't. You can sell your kids, can't you? But you can't sell your bedroom. <laughs> you could rent it, but then you might have to sleep out with the dog, wouldn't you? Oh, it is, and that's where people don't think about that in terms of the property market. Mm. It's like they're more fearful and greedy of the stock market because the stock market's it's valued every second of the day. Mm. So stocks are going up and down all the time. Market's going up and down all all of the time, like every second of every day. But people would have those same emotions if the, the value of their house was, they could just, you know, click onto Google and go, what's the value of my house? And then watch it going up and down every second mm. of the day. A lot of people wouldn't buy property because they'd know, be panicking. The funniest thing is that if property prices had fallen, say, 10%. And they have. People are not really worried about They're that. Not. But no. as soon as the stock market falls 2.5%. They're selling. <laughs> so let me ask you a question, and I know you know the answer to this because you're a genius. Oh, thank you. Is it far easier to buy stocks or sell stocks? Far easier to buy. Why is that? Because it's, I guess that the buy side for a start is so well publicised. Mm. The, there are brokers talking about it. All you need to do is mm. set up an account with us and then you just press a button. We'll even tell you some stocks to buy. So mm. people think that it's so easy to buy. But I mean, we've joked about mm. the fact that often the brokers are telling people when to buy but not telling people when to sell. So people end up sitting there and they never see the sells, they only see the buys. And I think that's part of it. You know, people expect to be um, led, I guess, to the decision rather than actually working out what's the best way for me to be able to manage that once I'm in it or what's the best way to sell. Mm. Mm. And we see, we see the results of that, you know, because that S word comes back into it, you know, the S word hits the fan. Yeah. Um, when things go wrong. And, we, and a huge example of that recently, well, not last week. How big? Huge <laughs> example of that. But two years ago, or not even two years ago, 2021, I think now, mm. wasn't it? Yeah, something like that. It was that GameStop. Oh, okay. You know, that was trading through the Robin Robinhood app. Mm. You know, the Robinhood app made buying and selling stocks gamified. So people have this app and more younger people, um, and I'm talking under 35-ish, they were just getting this green button. Chips. Buy, 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 mm. buy, buy. And it's like hitting a green button on your screen because this app's told you to buy this stock. There's not a real reason to buy the stock. But the challenge they, these people had is when things weren't looking good, the Robin Hood app stopped them selling the stock. Really? And so it's like, and that's what caused the issue. And these people were panicking, but they shouldn't have bought the stock in the first place. Mm because they didn't understand why they were buying it. So often the selling and the buying are so interrelated, it's not funny. And, and often people go, oh, I lost money on this stock. And I go, well, you shouldn't have bought it in the first place. But how is it that people buy. actually trust that to start with? And then when one a trade goes wrong or something doesn't happen or they don't get mm -hmm. a sell and it goes the wrong way, I mean, I wonder what goes through their head next time. Are they still pressing that buy button? But it's a false sense of... Um, importance in the information they've got. Mm. So they believe, and rightly or wrongly, and I know it's wrongly, but it rightly or wrongly, some people may think differently, but when they get a recommendation or a, you know, the green button comes up on their app, mm. they believe that somebody's done a lot of research behind that and said, this is a good stock that you should own and that that person is far more intelligent that you are, you are the person holding the phone and you have a better, they have a better idea of whether you should own that stock. So that's why that green button is there. Mm. And that's the biggest. So where's the checks and balances? Well, that's the biggest load of BS I've ever heard. Yeah. But that's what people say. I mean, it would be, would be interesting mm. from a trader's point of view who knows technical analysis to see when those buys come up and then be able to look at a chart and determine whether mm. it actually made sense Good to point. buy or not. 
And the same with the cells. But how often have we seen that by, by recommendations and, and, you know, we go and look at the chart and we go, I wouldn't buy that. Mm. It's just constant. They come out and we go, oh, I wouldn't buy that. Exactly. And I mean, I talk about that in my first book, How to Beat the Managed Funds by 20%, about yep. recommendations and everything else. But it really is, there's a whole lot of questions that people need to answer. If they've got a portfolio of stocks, they need to ask some questions around, well, what do they need to ask themselves before they start to sell? It's probably the way for me to answer mm. that question for it or ask that question of you is like, so what? what's the process? What should they be thinking of before they sell? Well, I mean, it's, it's, there's a whole mm. lot of things. Before they even buy, they should be thinking about mm. how they se- are going to sell for a start, yep. how they're going to manage. So before they that, buy. Yep. Before they buy, they should be thinking about what is the process that I'm going to use to sell and have some sort of a, I guess, a written um, agreement with themselves mm-hmm. as to how they're going to manage that because especially with people who are inexperienced and don't have proper rules, it's even far more important that they mm-hmm. actually have something documented that's going to tell them how they're going to manage their risk. And I think by sitting down and actually getting that pen and paper and trying to write it, they'll realise that they don't have a clue mm-hmm. and that will actually stop them from making some of the biggest mistakes in the stock market if and- they actually really listen to their emotions because it's the emotions that drive people to make decisions to make the biggest mistakes and it's the emotions that can be a way for them to really understand whether they're on the right track or not. Yeah, and I mean, you you are right. I mean, so Joe and Mary Average are sitting at home listening to this podcast. Well, they're not average because they're listening to this podcast. They're super sensational and fantastic because they are listening to the podcast but they've got a portfolio of shares mm. and they don't know – what they're going to do to sell them. So what you're saying to these people who are actually listening and and watching us on YouTube because we're now recording these on YouTube. So if you are listening to us on a podcast on the train or on the go to work, you can actually watch us recording this on video on our YouTube channel. So just go to Wealth Within TV on YouTube and you'll be able to watch this podcast live. But if they're sitting at home there with their portfolio and they go, oh, Janine says I need to have an exit strategy – what are the steps they've got to do to, to create that exit strategy on their book? Yeah. Um, or is that I too tough a question for I, you this early in the morning? It's so broad. <laughs> too broad. <laughs> it's so broad because it depends on who we're talking to. Okay. So, I mean, if we're talking to somebody who's mm-hmm. absolutely got no idea about any cell rules, they've, and if it's someone who's got some limited knowledge, that's another group. And if it's someone who's trading and has got um, – has actually put some rules into practice, but they're not really sure of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to put our traders and the people who have come through our courses in that group, but there's three of those, um, I guess, on the scale of one to three. Mm -hmm. But if it's someone who has absolutely no idea, I think it's about doing your research first. So having a read of some information, listening to as many podcasts as you can. Our podcasts. Our podcasts for one. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's good to also... Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm just going to say this. It's good to also listen to other podcasts as well because not as good as ours. you need reference points mm. to understand what's you know. what in the world. Now, if if they do that and they spend maybe three months, two to three months just doing research and getting a good understanding, they will know something. They'll know that they actually yeah. have to set a stop loss before they go into any stock or buy or any an exit, stock. Or uh, an exit an strategy. Exit strategy. Yeah. So like the, the initial exit strategy mm. to protect you, if you're absolutely wrong, it turns out to be that you're wrong because let's face it, I'm talking to a group of people who don't have proper rules. Yeah. So people who have proper rules and they're buying and selling can still have losing trades because it's part Correct. and parcel of trading. It's mm. all probability. So you are going to have losing trades. But to go into a trade and then – not use proper rules and then not have any proper rules to go out is just, in my book, crazy in these, this day and age. So mm-hmm. I guess it's about that first group who have no idea, just the understanding that you ought to be setting a stop loss. doesn't matter whether you're a long-term investor or a short-term investor, still mm-hmm. same thing should apply. And then if um, you're wanting at some point, you, you know that based on what we're talking about today and other things that you may be following on our, on YouTube and watching Talking Wealth, that you will need to actually understand how to set what's called a trailing stop loss. It's a stop loss or a, a way to manage your shares when you're actually in it. Mm-hmm. So you, it's a, just a decision-making tool really. Um, so it's as simple as this. Do I sell? Do I hold? Do I buy more or do I buy something else? All right. So I'm going to throw a spanner in the work because it's a comment a lot of people tell me or say to me, mm-hmm. not our students obviously. 
And they say, oh, I can't, can't sell my stock because I have to pay a lot of capital gains tax. Yeah, well, I mean, that's just nuts. You've got to really, I mean, I don't know whether that just comes from accountants or whether they I couldn't because if you really understood what that meant, mm. then you wouldn't be saying that because the capital gain is going to happen at some point. You, yeah, at some that's point, what you want. At some point, people sell houses. You're in it to, to invest until the point where it's no longer worth investing in that. Mm-hmm. And what point is that? That's the point of having the, some sort of a rules and exit strategy so that you can actually make an informed decision about that. Mm. But I think that really good accountants will be telling people, you know, you, you want to obviously be holding a stock for a length of time, mm-hmm. but even accountants would ha- give people exit strategies when they're running their business. They, you know, so why treat... Well, they do, but they don't Why treat that. the stock market any differently? Because it's just... a. A fun, you know, a fund essentially or a portfolio or in a business mm-hmm. um, that you're investing in. But I, I want to throw a, another hand grenade in there probably. I've met a lot of accountants obviously and some are brilliant you know, when it comes to investing mm. and helping with investors. But And I'm going to generalise with accountants is often their job is to minimise your tax. So they often will tell people don't sell the shares but they'll actually tell people that their business is not going really well to get out of it because they're losing money. So at what point is with, with those accountants that they're actually saying, well, don't sell your shares, you're going to be paying capital gains tax. But if that share is coming, is going to fall away 20, mm. 30, 40, 50%. But they don't know that though. They don't know that. Because they're not, well, mm. they might, they, they, some accountants are actually educated in the stock market. Some, We've had but the vast some majority do courses. aren't. Mm. And that's the, the, the challenge. And I mean, we saw it during the GFC. Um, a lot of people didn't sell because they're going to pay a capital gains tax. And I know when I've spoke. If we um, called our course risk management in the stock market, I guarantee you that more people would actually do the course. Wouldn't they? I, guarantee me. I guarantee you that if we, called it, if we called it risk management in the stock market for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for everyone. For everyone. That so many more people would do it yeah. because... So many people want to understand how to manage their risk. Well, now. we talked about that last in our last podcast we did. Yeah, they haven't quite connected that managing your risk means selling. It does. Yeah. Absolutely it does. T- so okay, so another another bomb. People talk to me about stocks. Oh, I can't sell it because it pays a great dividend. Yep. Yeah. I mean, what do you think about that? Like That's Telstra, a good one. Telstra, That's classic example. Mm. For ten years it went south. It went over sixty two percent down from its mm. highs. And yet for 10 years, people keep saying to me, oh, I'm not selling because I'm happy to get a dividend. 4% dividend. I'm happy to get 4%, but I'm going, like, great, you're going to lose, you're losing 20% to make, to mm. get 4%. So that means you're down 16%. So that's smart investing. Yeah. And that's there's, there's a period too. of time when those dividends go up, when the share price is initially falling. So then everyone thinks they're getting a MOTS a dividend, and they're not. but then it's going to dry up. And we remember when that happened and they started mm. cutting dividends. So, But I know in terms happen. of dividends, it is a consideration when we're looking to sell a stock because it's like if you want to sell, you know, mm. let's say Commonwealth Bank today and it's going to pay go X dividend tomorrow, then you don't sell it today. Yeah, because it's probably worthwhile keeping on to the div- getting that dividend. So I know that's one of the considerations that when we're looking to sell stocks, we do look at when the dividend is due to be paid. If it's you know two three months down the track or whatever it is, then it's not worth the consideration. But mm. you've got to look at what's what's the possibility of the stock price falling before the dividend's paid, or falling the amount or more of the dividend before the dividend is paid, and whether it's worthwhile hanging on. Now I know. You know, we teach our students to look at those sorts of things and actually, you know, do their calculations and analyze it to see whether that's worthwhile. But how would somebody who's not one of our educated, highly educated students look at that process? Oh, that's a really tough question. I didn't say it was going to be easy today. I've I'm, I'm got lots of tough questions for you. All right. Just thinking about that one a little <laughs> bit and not wanting to just, I don't like giving people a single answer on those sort of things because there is no single answer on that one. Well, give them half a single answer. So I guess the thing for anyone is that mm. you, first of all, you have to understand when stocks go ex-dividend and then you, you've got to understand what actually occurs when a stock goes ex-dividend. What does it mean and what occurs? And so mm. when a stock goes ex-dividend, just in case you're not aware, it means that it's trading excluding the dividend. So after that point, anyone who buys is no longer entitled to the dividend. Now, um, so a lot of people try to buy right before that ex-dividend date, which is really interesting for a start to try to get the dividend, not understanding that often 
stocks will fall, the um, value of the dividend and more. Now, the more they fall of in terms of the value of the dividend often means that the market may not um, favour that share. So the less they fall, obviously the share is more tightly held and not being sold off as much. And that can be a really good sign, but it can also relate to the volatility of the share, as you mm. know, yeah. in terms of how far the stock may fall after a stock goes ex-dividend. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's something, It's a, first of all, it's about an awareness of but that's cool. I mean, what you're just talking about then is dividend stripping, which ne- they in- they no, I'm not. I'm not talking they- about dividend stripping. I'm just talking about having yeah. an awareness of what mm. happens when a stock goes ex dividend. Yeah, but you were talking about dividend no, stripping I, just I wasn't. before. That. I was talking about they're buying, buying before the. Just they're to buying get the to get the dividend. It doesn't mean they're just going to sell it to get the dividend. Well, they've got the 45 day rule in now. Yeah, so but they can't just buy. That's and sell. right. Yeah, but some people might. Just buy it just before thinking, oh, the stock's going up. There's a good news report. I'll get a dividend yeah, soon. Got, they've still got to hold it for 45 days after the dividend to Look, be able to get How that. many investors will do that? Not many these days. No, not more, so much More anymore. so people will just be thinking, oh, I want to buy a share. Mm. This one looks good It's and it's being talked about in the media. It's just had a re- good report and I can get a good dividend of, you know, market average or above. Okay, so consider the dividend before you sell. Next one so, yep. is, I know a lot of people, if, if, you know, like last year, 2020, whenever it was, 2022, you know, we're saying, oh, you know, the market was, was going down mm. a little bit in the first half of the year. But people just blanket sold all of their stocks. Mm. A whole lot of people did. True. So you just sell one or did you sell two or did you sell all of the stocks? Because really when somebody sells all of their stocks in one hit, I, I mean, I, and I know the case is there's the opposite is I know yep. people go, oh, I've got $100,000 to invest, Dale. And I've just bought six stocks and I go, when? And they go, yesterday. And I go, so you put all the $100,000 in all six stocks. Mm-hmm. I go, yeah. And I go, hmm, six buys all in the same day. That's interesting, isn't it? So, but Who they does do, that? Who does that? The it's funds like, do that. The managed funds do that. The stockbrokers do that because it's easy. I get it. Mm. It's they all get that. It's all client, done. In, they got get a new client done in one yep. hit. Mm. And we've never done that in our life and I've never done that. But it's not just because it's easy. It's because that's what the mandate is about. Yeah, but if they're buying individual stocks, like if you go to a stockbroker to give you personal advice and say, here's a hundred grand, whatever it is, generally they'll put them all in the stocks as mm. quick as they possibly can. And then they go next mm. and they're on to the next person because they get paid by making sure you're in the marketplace. So, but, the, but you know the point what? Is, it do doesn't I, always happen like that. Just to be fair to the brokers, mm-hmm. sometimes you get a situation where the investor says, I want to buy something. What can I buy? Well, that's true too. You know, and they're sort of pushing to buy something. So it's really about... But that's the right... That's make them understanding when the right time is to buy. Maybe that's another podcast. Yeah, so the investor needs to understand things enough to make it investor-driven rather than just being driven by... Okay, sell one stock or sell the whole portfolio. That's the question. Yeah, so if you if you want to sell something to take mm-hmm. some money out... Mm-hmm. The, well, let's say... Let's put two contexts on it. Okay. Let's Context one is the market's falling away a bit. And I'm worried about the market. The second one is I need to buy something. Okay. The market's falling away a bit. I'm worried about the market. It's not a good enough reason to sell. Mm. For a start, you need to have some, I guess, yardstick that's telling you that when, at what point is the market likely to continue and to fall? And would you sell all stocks in your portfolio? And we talk about it on the show about okay. how far the market can fall when it pulls mm. back. Mm. We, we talked about it. We talk about it like, oh, I think it's pretty much almost every month when we well, we do. that. We do. But would you sell all of the stocks in your portfolio just because you're thinking that the market may be falling away? Well, see, that's a question, isn't it? Because when, G- when the GFC hit, yeah. there were triggers to sell lots of stocks. So Correct. you would have cleared out your portfolio if you had But they were giving rules. us signals three, four, five, six months in advance. Before the biggest drop. Before the biggest drop. So mm. we were doing that with our analysis. Like, this is what's mm. always happening. Whereas... Investors were piling money into the market at that stage. Mm. They were piling it in in managed funds. They were buying stocks and buying stocks, margin lending, everything we've talked about before. The mm. huge amount of investing was going in and we were selling at the time mm. because of the rules that we look at. So good stocks will generally give you rules that to get out of them before the market falls away yeah. and fall, or falls away too much. Now, as in I a said, normal market, correction. in a normal market. But last yeah. year, in 2022, especially the last more the last six months, 
we had so much doom and gloom, like the stock market's crashing, the stock market's crashing, the stock mm. market's crashing. I got hammered on YouTube by people going, Dale, the stock market's crashing, don't yeah, you so know? He, there are times when people just sell everything because they're And they were just selling everything. I was mm. sitting out of the market and yet our market from one June last year went up mm. over, I think it was like 18% to the end of January. Yep. It's like, so you, if you're sold on that negative news, you wouldn't get a return. Mm. You're out of the marketplace. So, But then it depends on your rules, of yeah, course. Yeah, so blanket don't sell all your stocks in your portfolio all one time just because no, you get No, if you're going to take some money out of your portfolio, you can do it in a very strategic so this way. this is if you're going to buy something. This is if you're going to something. sell something regardless. Oh, okay. Right? But let's just allow... I'm just getting context here. Let's just allow that for anybody who wants to sell. Okay. So anyone who wants to sell, it's possible mm. to take a small amount off each individual mm. share. Yeah. But when we're looking at portfolios and someone um, sends in an application and they say, look, I want to withdraw some funds. We used to have clients who would withdraw small amounts just for their living expenses Yes, every so often. And it would be a matter of, well, is there any cash available? So when you look at the portfolio, it's not just looking at shares. People think just looking at a portfolio is just shares. No, no. it's not. From the outset, you've got to decide how much you're going to invest and that will include mm. cash and shares until you're fully invested and then you might sell some and then you've got a little bit of cash and you're waiting to put that cash into mm. other stocks. But if there's not sufficient cash such that it doesn't muck up your risk management rules on your portfolio, and we've done a podcast about risk management in the stock market and we yep. talk about risk management. You talk about it in your books. You've got yep. good examples the in the book as well, how to manage That's risk across word. It starts with the portfolio and position size your portfolio. Mm. Mm. You love those four-letter words. That, and um, Easier to spell. Yeah, but so you could take a, sm a small amount out of the cash component if it doesn't muck up your risk equation. So say, for example, mm. that somebody had six positions in the market, like you were talking before, except he hadn't put all the cash in. He'd had maybe, you know, the other 40% mm. was just sitting in cash and he had out of use 10, the cash, don't 10 use small the stock positions. Unless you have to, yeah. Then he can take some money out of the cash, but then you don't want to leave um, – the portfolio in such a situation that you don't have enough cash to be able to buy those additional positions mm. and all your risk is then concentrated into just a few stocks. I gave six as an example, but it could be a different amount. You know, yeah. someone might have held two stocks and they've used most of the cash and then they're just sitting in two or three stocks, which is not a, well, this brings another not a great way to do it. it. So if you're looking at selling stocks because you need some money to settle on a property or whatever, you need school mm. fees, whatever the, the situation is, is... Do people sell stocks they're making money on or do yes. they sell the ones they're losing money on? They sell stocks they're making money on. Okay. Is that a wise thing for them to do? Well, it depends because some people might be pushed by the view, I don't want to have a capital gains tax event. They might have mm. sold. It's, see, there are lots of different answers here because it mm. may be that they've sold um, some stocks and made a profit at some point yep. and then they think, oh, I'll just sell these ones because they've got a loss there so I can offset the profit against the loss. But that's tax minimisation. I that's know. That's different but, than... But that's not looking at what share should be sold. Correct. So it may be that there's a share in your portfolio that's falling that actually is at high risk of continuing to fall. And and so it's a matter of looking at the risk first, I think, across the portfolio mm -hmm. and being prepared to sell something that's at a loss. Well, if, I mean, I agree with it because that's what I was, I was getting at because mm -hmm. people say, oh, no, I don't want to sell. I'm losing money on it. And, you know, I'll sell it when it gets back up to what I paid for it and all the different yeah. ex excuses mm -hmm. that we hear. And as people who've been listening to this podcast long enough know that I, I treat excuses a lie covered with the skin of reason. They're justifying to themselves why they're not doing the right thing, mm. basically, because if a stock is in loss, you need to look at, well, how much more are you going to lose? on that and sometimes it's better to get out of that and leave the money mm. in the ones that are going up and use the money that out of one that you are losing for whatever you need to purchase or whatever it is. But you've got to get over that fear that you're talking about. Um, and, you know, it's whilst you have a capital loss on a, a, a stock that's losing shares, if you do sell that, that will offset tax anyway for mm. profits, as you just mentioned. But it also frees your mind up and it frees up your worry. Mm. Like it's not there in your portfolio anymore for you to stress about. True. That's a really you know? good one. But people are often too quick to sell something in profit for fear of losing the profit. Mm. 
and they're loath to sell stocks that are losing money I'm for, you know, for, for that whole I can think of an example. Thing, oh, I'm wrong. And I know it's a guy thing, you know, I'm wrong. If yeah, I have I can, to sell it's not loss. just a guy thing. I, I mean, I was mm. talking to a woman, this was a couple of years ago, and she had a portfolio mm. that a broker had set up for her. Yeah. She had some really good stocks in that portfolio. Yeah. But there were a couple of stocks that had actually wiped out the profits on a couple of the good stocks because they'd yeah. fallen 50%. One of them, uh, this was maybe been actually longer than a couple of years ago, it was Maya. Yep. Um, and it had just kept falling and falling away. And I said, when are they going to tell you to sell it? She said, I don't know. Mm. And they I don't. I said, well, you know, how much are you prepared to risk on that stock? She hadn't even given it that sort of thought. But that's a, yeah. But mm. it's, people treat this as, and and it's, I mean, obviously we, we, we've been doing this for well over two decades, but I find people think, it's too hard, Janine. Mm. I don't understand this stuff. It's too hard. I'd just rather let things happen and that'll be fine. You know, it's because it, it's too hard to learn or too hard to me to know the rules around all this sort of stuff. And but it's, it, think about those people when the GFC hit. It was too hard for them to even comprehend what had just happened. I figure if you can learn how to use the remote control on your TV, you can learn how to exit a stock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and it is. It's that easy if you mm. understand just a few basic rules. Mm. Are you going to get it right all the time? Maybe not. But then I don't get the remote all the time because sometimes I'm sitting there going, "What the <laughs> hell is this button doing? And how do I get back to where I want to go?" Yeah. You know, or those the apps or whatever else. But if you can work out a remote control for your TV, then yep. you can work out how to exit a stock. What, what, what's interesting to me is yeah. people might have maybe fifty, hundred, whatever, yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars in the stock market, and they quibble over spending a couple a thousand or maybe ten thousand on doing a course. But potentially, all that has to happen is the market falls 10, 15, yeah. 20, 30 percent. How much is their portfolio down? Yeah. Um, and how much could that ten thousand or two thousand for some of our courses have saved them? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you another tough, real tough question. So hang on to your seats for this one. When the market's going down, is every stock in your portfolio going down? Yes, generally. There's generally. usually, there might be like the odd one, but yeah. when the market's in one of those big declines, it's usually a market- That's a big decline. Driven okay. decline. Yeah, so in a normal, just a normal bit of a pullback. Yeah, and it happens no. in stages too. Yeah. So not everything falls at the start. Yeah. So some sectors of the market will fall first, depending on what so the industry- not all the time. Not all your stock's falling all the time. There'll be a number of months where everything's falling together. Like when when, the, when there's a, a broader fall. market decline. Yep. But if it's not a big fall, that you're not likely to see all of your stocks falling at the same time. Okay, let's flip it now. So if the market's rising, are all of your stocks always rising in the market? No. Okay. So the flip side works as well. Mm. So to me is then selling blanketly is not a good strategy. Mm-hmm. Especially if the market's normal, we're not talking you mean about selling the lot. I'm not talking about GFC. I'm not talking about COVID type stuff. You know where they're big, big yeah, meltdowns. But you mean selling the lot's not a good idea. Yeah, selling the lot's not a big idea. Now, obviously, we need to give people some strategies for selling some stocks because obviously, um, you know, we've talked about property. But before you can't that, sell property. they could sell. The, mm. the, the theory is that you can sell a stock that you think is at risk. That's what we've just talked about. Mm. Potentially is at, is putting placing unnecessary risk on the portfolio because it's falling and could fall a lot further. Correct. Yeah. Or you sell a portion of individual shares so as not to upset the balance of the overall risk across your portfolio. Or if there's cash and shares, which your portfolio has got to be made up of both, at any one time you might have some cash available. You look at taking some of the money out of the cash as long as that doesn't upset yeah. the balance too much. Okay. So. No. I have people telling me that you can't go broke taking a profit, mm. which is BS in my book because mm -hmm. you can, you know, because people will sell a stock that's in profit. They might set themselves a dollar figure or a percentage figure. And then it plummets. And then, well, no, the I'm not talking falls. about plummeting. No, I'm talking about they no, buy No, but if the they keep thinking that a stock's going to get to a level or a dollar figure. No, I'm just talking one about. One day, one of them won't. Correct, but what they what I'll off, we see often people do is they'll buy a stock and hold it for two or three weeks and and say oh when it gives me five percent profit I'll get out or ten mm. percent profit I'll get out or if I make fifty cents on it I'll get out. So there's no rule. The strategy is if it gets if it gets up this many percent I just exit because their fear the fear mm. in those people is I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. So if it's in profit this much I'm just going to get off the table. But what they don't realise is doing that they subject themselves to their portfolio being in a much high risk of being in a loss situation because if you keep taking 10% profits 
on stocks that you sell, but you have stocks that you lose 50 or more percent on, mm. which is what you were just talking about, then your portfolio return is going to be C-R-A-P-P-P-P-P. Mm. Why? It's going to be terrible. Yep. And and so this Especially is Especially if then you've been doing that for a while and yeah. all of a sudden you get a big hit in the market yes. and everything falls. So it's what I wanted to bring up is is because with the whole topic is about when to sell. It's not always selling in a mm. loss situation or it's not always selling when the stocks are going down. It's selling when they're going up. And too many people do that in my opinion. What's yours? Look, I mean, for a beginner mm. who doesn't have a lot of rules and is in that position, obviously mm. I'm going to say you need to get some more education but I don't have a big um, issue with people selling to make a, you know, selling when the stock's in profit, provided they've, they're doing something about managing that downside risk. So if they don't have, there's, a, there's an argument that says we want everybody to have proper rules, and we do. We do. However, if they don't have proper rules for the, to manage the profit, but they're yeah. still manage, taking some profits, as long as they have some sort of risk management strategy on the downside, more than likely and money management, they're still going to make, the chances of them making a profit are still good. They just might not be able to extract out what they potentially could out of it. Mm. But if you own a stock now, you should have a strategy for how to manage it while it rises. Yes. And the strategy is when you're going to exit. You mentioned a trailing stop loss before. We talk about those in my both of my books. Yeah. We talk about trailing stop losses. But one of them is a trend line that we talk mm. about in my book. The other one... Um, and that's a really simple one. It's, that just, it's such use. a simple You started trend. with, with that just with a pencil and a ruler. I did. And when I, I used to say to people, how would you like to learn how to make money with a yeah. simple pencil and a ruler? And people go, what? I go, yeah, mm. all you need is a pencil and a ruler and you're going to make a hell, hell of a lot of money on the marketplace. And I call it adult join the dots. Yep. And they're like, what? I go, can you join, can you make mark three dots on a piece of paper? And they go, yeah. And I go, can you get a ruler and a pencil and draw a line? Mm. And can you, or could you afford to buy a ruler and pencil to do that? And they go, yeah. And I go, well, you can make money on the market. Yep. And it's, that's what I'm saying is if you can work out your remote, mm. you can definitely do that. Mm. You know what I'm just talking about. And it's not rocket science, but I know people make emotional decisions and, you know, they don't I guess getting the book is the first thing because mm. then they'll really understand what you're talking about. I mean, just to hear us talking about how simple the rules are in one sense, it's sort of like, you know, they don't have those reference points. So if just getting the book gives them that, Correct. they'll be miles the in front. Either book will have I, it I can remember people coming and shaking your hand, just thanking you for, it was the best 30 bucks that they'd ever spent. And now it's, now and it's, now it's for free, free the first get, one. Yeah. We've just got to pay the shipping. So yeah. it's all pretty good like that. So to me, there's obviously, we've talked about different types of stop losses mm. in the book. We talk about an initial stop loss when you buy the stock. So we generally say on a blue chip stock, 15% below your buy price. So that's an exit strategy. Yeah. So that's one of them. Then you mentioned trailing stop losses, which we talked about trend lines or a trailing mm. stop loss. In my other book, Accelerate Your Wealth, there's another exit strategy in there, another trailing stop loss in there people could learn about it mm. um, to actually manage the exit strategy. And it works so well yeah, to help people understand that. But anybody, and those books are written for people who have like year 10. Like you don't have to have a PhD or be a rocket scientist. It's actually probably preferable if you're not a rocket scientist or have a PhD. Um, but and the fun thing about yeah. it is once they actually start trying to use it and putting it into practice, it just becomes so much easier. Mm. It is. All of those roadblocks start to just disappear and they think, oh, why didn't I do this before? And then I would have had no reason to worry at night about what's happening with my portfolio. Yeah, I think people worry. The thing is, is false, fear is false evidence appearing, appearing real and knowledge mm. is the enemy of fear. And that's what we're trying to impart here to people is just don't blindly buy and sell. Mm. You know, know what you're doing, know why you're buying and buy the right stocks. But then if you bought the right stocks, then you have less fear of selling and you have less fear of getting it wrong and having stocks fall away at you. And if you have a good yep. management strategy when they're in profit and by using a trailing stop loss, which if you own a share right now, you should always have a trailing stop loss or an exit strategy mm. written down like you said. You have a little thing and if you've got a partner and you're doing this together, um, you know, keep each other honest on that sort of stuff and mm. then follow that rules. But to me, the, the biggest piece of advice I give traders is get comfortable with selling. Mm. Get comfortable with selling. The quicker you learn how to sell, the more money you're going to make. And I'll keep saying it till the cows come home. Get mm. used to selling, and the more comfortable you are with the selling. There the are more a lot of people make. looking for this information mm. right now on how to do this, and okay. I think that's not going to change. I think with everything mm. that's gone on in the last few years, it's becoming more important. So I want to just give 
as we go, I want to just give a little bit of credit to people. Is this people your famous last words? Because I, th- I actually think that people are listening now and they're really starting to appreciate I hope so. how important this part of the process is for them when they're thinking of investing. And I've lost a lot of hair over this pushing this <laughs> for the last few decades. So is there anything else you want to add before I go, thank you for this enlightening podcast? Um, no, I actually think that we've done a great job in covering it. Thank you so much. I'd just say, I guess I'd say keep some mm. sort of a record other than just what's in your broking account. Mm. Keep it in a spreadsheet as well or some other record externally so you can keep the cash and shares and the percentages of the shares at any one time so you understand the weightings of what you're holding. Mm. Not so much in relation to weightings. This could be another podcast that we talk about. You know, I think so. Um, but just so that you understand what the risk is, how much are you down on any individual share and what does that mean as a percentage of your overall portfolio? I think that's really important. Well, if people want us to cover a subject, please send it through to info at wealthwithin.com.au. Mm. Happy to investigate some of the things that you want answers to, you know, but also head over to talkingwealth.com because there's a wealth of knowledge over there and, and become a member of talkingwealth.com. It's like under four bucks a week to get a wealth of information, not just our market reports and our live stream, but hundreds of videos from really great experts, not just on stock markets, property, it's investing, it's superannuation, it's business, it's entrepreneurship, it's um, understanding your psychology and success principles. There's just so much there. So get over to talkingwealth.com and subscribe and we'll see you over there. But I think that's that, That's it from us on, on um, exiting the stock market. So you've been listening to Talking Wealth. You've been here with uh, the wonderful co-host Janine Cox and myself, Dale Gillam. Thank and, you. Uh, I will say goodbye. See you next time. Take care of everybody. Bye for now. <laughs>